Good morning. This is Conversations with Marsha. And today I have a wonderful guest named Scott Hambrick, who runs a program called Online Great Books. Uh, the Conversations with Marsha is sponsored by The Great Connections, which is an educational program for young people dedicated to helping them have optimal education in order to live their best life. Uh, Scott, uh, thank you so much for, for coming today and to talk to us. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know that you run online great books and you were formerly a tech guy, but I think the audience would like more detail. Uh, God, I hate this part. Um, I'm 46 <laughs> years old. I am male. I live right now in Catoosa, Oklahoma. I don't know. Uh, Where's that? I have a microbiology. Where is that? Yeah. Where, yeah, we're in, I've been here in Northeast Oklahoma, uh, okay. outside of Tulsa. And um, I have a, a microbiology background, microbiology, organic chemistry, or chemistry background, uh, although in my formal education, although I never really used that, um, I, I owned, operated a business called Data Storage here in Tulsa for about 20 years. I sold that thing in 1919. That's how old I'm getting. In 2018, the end of 2018, and uh, uh one, because um, the business environment is too bizarre for me nowadays. I just can't hardly take it anymore. Um, and um, I got one. I, I, I had a guy call me and he said, hey, you know, I'd sure like to buy your business. And I gave him one of those go to hell numbers, you know. And he mm -hmm. said, okay. <laughs> so wow. he called my bluff. So, yeah. so I had to go take it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was already working on online great books at that time. We were already, uh, it was already about a year old and was, it was working and we were helping people with that. And my kids are, um, my kids are, they're now 16 and 18 and, and uh, kind of that late adolescent, early adulthood stage. I thought it'd be awfully good to not worry about my, my big small business and to uh, mm -hmm. change it all up. So I sold that out uh, then and uh, been working with them and in online great books. Uh, uh, all in all, it's full time now. And uh, online great books is a, it's a great books program. It's an, I don't know what it is. What is it? Marsha is an adult education program that's web-based where uh, we, we help mostly adults. It doesn't have to be, but we help mostly adults uh, read the great books. We, we uh, once a month, we send them a package that has what we think is the finest edition of one of the books of the great books of the Western world to their home. We send them these reading goals and uh, try to help keep them accountable with reading 30 minutes a day, six days a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, then once a, once a month, they take whatever they've read for that month and discuss it in a two hour seminar with one of our seminar hosts, which mm -hmm. might be you or my podcast partner, Carl Shute or someone else where we use that, that, uh, that famous great books uh, discussion method to, to cover books like the Iliad or the Odyssey or uh, Aristotle's politics. We've got a bunch of people reading that right now and uh, all upset about it, which is good. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do there. It's a lot of fun. He believes that. in slavery. Well, he says there are natural slaves. Yes. No, I'm just, I'm just being sarcastic about the, <laughs> what people do when they walk away from when, when they're talking about Aristotle's politics. But yeah. I wanted to get back to how did you, well, let's talk later a little bit uh, about um, the great books themselves. But I wanted to t uh, talk to you. I first saw you on a podcast called Barbell Logic oh, yeah. when you were calling your program Intellectual Linear Progression. Yeah. And uh, you were explaining you know, why people should read the great books. But I was wondering how you yourself got in it. Got uh, well, we were sending our kids to the snotty prep school here in Tulsa, you know, that costs too much. It is supposedly good. And uh, it wasn't any good. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what did you mean? What was wrong with it? Well, school, school isn't really about education. I don't think in most cases it's about it's about um, playing out a game. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you want to get to good grades. You want to go and get your Eagle Scout patch and you want to do your uh, volunteer work at the, school, at, the, at the hospital or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you want to apply to 47 schools and you go to the best college you can go to and blah, blah, blah. And then hopefully you get an internship. And, blah, blah, blah. and then and maybe if you're lucky, you get married and you have, you know, 1.2 kids because you don't have... We don't reproduce it 
at a replacement rate any longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, you live in a house that people respect and you just live this, <laughs> you know, you just this live out the lock script. Step, this whole lockstep yeah. uh, procedure of how you're supposed to live your life. And that, that's encouraged in school. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And, and um, you know, public schools, you know, people argue, well, they do this in on, at online great books. We have a, an education channel in our, uh, in our community where mm -hmm. they talk about this kind of stuff. And, and uh, late, recently there were some people in there talking about private schools and how much better they were than public schools. I'm like, mm, most of the time they're just better at school. So if you want school, good for you. But if you actually want to have children that have tools and uh, agency and power to actually live a, a, the sort of life they would like, but maybe that's not what you want. Mm -hmm. In fact, the better the school is at doing school, the less of a chance your child will have at being an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're, the, the better the school is at doing school, the better they are at producing a conformable product. It's very conforming. Which yeah. is your child, you know? And yeah. you know, maybe in 1961, Maybe that was a good thing, you know. You would you would go to the best college you could. Uh, well, the schools were probably actually educating more. You know, at by the time you were in eighth grade, that you'd covered more media material than a high school senior had now. And then you would go to a college, and then you could be a professional, an engineer, or whatever. And you know, you could be creative in that work and whatever. But the game has changed, and they continue to play. They continue to fight the last war, like we always do. And and uh, um, we didn't like it. My wife even taught at that school I was talking mm -hmm. about. And we pulled the kids out and decided we were going to homeschool them. And when we were looking at homeschool them, homeschooling them, you know, got to figure out what to do. And in doing that, I realized, well, I, my education had lots of holes in it. I was mm -hmm. all science and technology, mm -hmm. science mostly, and uh, hadn't, hadn't read so many of these books, hadn't been exposed to so many of these kinds of ideas. Uh, so I decided I needed to go make up those holes for myself. And I, I decided that after a bunch of research, I thought, well, Mortimer Adler's great books, kind of home group setting that he set forth in the 40s and 50s and well, until he died, I thought, this looks like a good way to do it. This mm -hmm. looks like a good way for an adult busy person to do this. So I started it, started a group in my home. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. I just want to back up a, a, a little bit on what you're saying. So I mean, what I've noticed about the best private schools is that they're really good. Well, they're, they're really good at conforming to get into college, but also they're, the part of their education that's better is where they're teaching math and science in mm -hmm. the sense that they, they can, the, the kids can take a lot of advanced math and science in these uh, prep schools. Um, is, although I have my problems with the way they teach science because they teach it uh, kind of acontextually in the sense that you don't understand why the science arose or, uh, you know, who, who was interested in this, what problem was it solving or anything like that, which really makes a huge difference in terms of your understanding and appreciation of what's going on. But what, what is it about the other side of what they're teaching that you said, like, tell me a little bit, first of all, about your own educational experience and what was it that was missing that you said that even the best prep schools were not, are not giving you? Well, I was, you know, K through 12, I was uh, in rural Oklahoma, you know, where they just warehouse kids until they can be tried as adults, you know. It was a terrible, terrible education. It wasn't an education. Um, and then I ended up going to the University of Oklahoma. What didn't you learn? What didn't you learn that you wished you'd learned about? I, I don't, well, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble now. Uh, I don't even know that they should be teaching anybody anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have, it's not so much a list of things that, that were left out. I should never have been there. None of us should ever have even been there. The institution shouldn't even exist. It's a minimum penitentiary, minimum security penitentiary. They hold people, these kids in until, uh, I wasn't even kidding, until they could be tried as adults. And they could actually do something with them. Uh, they're just, you know, they're just trying to free up the parents to go be economic units and, you know, so mom and dad can work and the kids are all under the watchful eye of the state for a time. You know, that's what we did from 830 to three o'clock on Monday through Friday during the school year, you know. So you didn't feel like you learned anything there? No, 
not not very much not mm -hmm. very much you know miss deavers taught us how to diagram sentences i didn't know why it mattered uh, mm -hmm. i had a, a good yeah isn't that isn't that always the case they have you do these things but they don't explain to you why it's important at all what does that help you with yeah I, I, and to be fair i don't think she knew why no i know yeah years later years later uh gosh it's been in the last five years i i uh i bought an audio recording of leonard peacoff's grammar Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that thing? Uh -huh. You know, and he describes exactly how language maps on reality and how you use grammar to accurately convey your conception of reality mm -hmm. to another person's consciousness. He, mm -hmm. he, he just describes it. I mean, it's there. Mm -hmm. Betty Devers, she didn't know. She yeah. just thought it would, they were, she, Betty Devers, bless her heart, she probably dead now, was just an officious lady who really enjoyed the structure and rules of that schema. Mm -hmm. That's what it was for her. And she tried to try to instill that same sort of enthusiasm and care for rule following and schema that she had. So that's what it was for her. But when she, you, um, so tell me uh, how you encountered the great books and why, what they are, <laughs> and then why they caught your attention as being so much richer, like teaching you so much more. Well, well, the, what they are, who knows? There are books that people tend to think are better than others. Why? Right? People argue about what's going to be on the list or not, so on. But almost any good faith person would agree that Plato should be on the list, that Aristotle should be on the list, that Homer should be on the list. There are things that are all, there are authors in books who good faith people just don't differ about. You know, we might argue about whether Jeremy Bentham or Hume or somebody like that should be on the list. But there's a core of stuff that is so influential and so thought provoking and so challenging that anybody that cares and has any honesty about them whatsoever says are important and should be read. So those are the criteria, influential, thought provoking. And what was the last one? Uh, I don't know. Oh, you said three, this way, but I forgot well, already. <laughs> well, I, I think that they are, they're thought provoked, they're endlessly discussable is one of the- Oh, yes, I think you said They're that. endlessly discussable. Yeah. Uh, and, and for me, it's, it's influential is, mm -hmm. is probably the main thing. Now, there is stuff on the list that's, you know, sort of imaginative literature, like maybe Shakespeare, mm -hmm. uh, that has an influence that is a little different than the kind of influence I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, what are you going to learn about Mm. the good life or, poly or the way people should interact on the polis from Shakespeare. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Really? I think you could learn tremendous amounts from reading Shakespeare. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that. We can fight about him. Aeschylus is better than Shakespeare. We'll talk about that later. Uh, I like <laughs> Aristophanes too. And yeah. Oscar Wilde. <laughs> the Greeks are really good. Uh, but but I, I am interested in pr primarily, this is just me personally in the, in the, in the works of philosophy and the big ideas that are presented in the philosophical and scientific works in, in the canon. So, you know, what we named what some of those are. I also think that this canon, the canon, the great books of the Western world, I'm making the air quotes for people who can't see, um, is a self-evident emergent list. So if you go pick up a book that, and you're like, wow, this Nietzsche guy, mm -hmm. <laughs> What a book. This guy's a madman. Look at all this. You know, look at these crazy ideas. And he's refuting this Hegel guy. What the hell is that? Oh, well, if I care, I got to go read Hegel now, you know, and you go find Hegel. And then Hegel talks about Kant. And then maybe they talk about Aquinas. And then maybe they talk about Aristotle. I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, now I've got to go read these four things. And then you go pick them up at Aristotle. He stone, he just makes a, a great steel man case uh, for anybody that preceded him. So if you go read his politics, he's going to talk about Plato. He's going to talk about uh, Xenophon. He's going to talk about everybody that's talked about it before. Now you got to go read them. So if you pick up any one of these good books, they tend to refer the ones that came before them. And you can see over time, you can see how there's sort of a genealogy of thought. You know, um, uh, Nietzsche actually wrote a book called The Genealogy of Morals and Sentiment. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. So you, you can see that there and um, you know, you can kind of politicize it if you want, you can try to put your own preference in there, but man, talk on it. Mostly it's an emergent list that if you're a careful person, you will find yourself following. 
And so it's, it's not only that these ideas are so great, but they, they have influenced everything that we're thinking and doing today. And yeah. if you want to understand why we're here today with what, we're, what we have, you need to understand where it came from. Yeah, it's the super swimming in, you know, whether you're a reader or not. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll always like to lead seminars on the Iliad because um, people that read it for the first time find out just how influential it was. You know, mm-hmm. Helen's the face that launched a thousand ships, and that was mm-hmm. a Marlowe poem. You know, they, they didn't know, a lot of people don't even know where it no. came from. Yeah. You know, we know that, you know, if you're a shit talker, you're hectoring someone. Well, that's Hector. Like, he's the mm-hmm. most legendary a crap talking athlete in the ever mm-hmm. and so that's what we, you know yeah our whole our whole culture is just suffused with this stuff and uh you know uh, whether you're super interested in what aristotle has to say about politics or not uh, reading these things exposes how our culture was formed by them and is as informed by them and that's one i think it's important to know where it comes from and not just think that it's just i don't know like the air you breathe, like it actually came from somewhere. It was a gift from somebody at some time. I yeah. think that's important. Mm-hmm. And then it's awfully fun too to just see uh, where these things come from as we read these, read these books. You know, I think there's another thing that's very important too that most people don't talk about when it comes to the great books. And that is the fact that it shows this whole tradition of reasoning, which you know, Aristotle was the first one to make explicit how we go about reasoning. And it was a fantastic identification on his part. It made all the rest of what's happened possible. And, you know, the other, there, uh, in other cultures, they have great works of fiction, some of philosophy, but there's not this tradition of explicit reasoning. And it's one of the things that really makes the Western world distinctive from the rest of the, the high cultures. And I think it's something that's important to, to realize um, when you're talking about, well, why study these things rather than other things? Yeah, I get a lot of people that will email me and say, well, why don't you read the Upanishads? Why don't you read Epic of Gilgamesh or whatever? Hey, look, you know, go read them, you know? I, I, but, but it's not the same thing. Yeah. It does not share that genealogy that comes from ancient Greece. Um, that's, it's based on that reasoning. It, it's just not there. It's an entirely different thing. And I'll go ahead and say it. It's it, in so far as it does not follow that it is inferior and it's incomplete. Yes. You know, it may have a wonderful aesthetic. It may have a great deal to teach and offer, but it is not the same. Yeah. It is not on the same level. Uh, well, I was even, I, re- I recently, I have a, a group of uh, students who are my alumni from my programs, and we've been doing an online discussion group, and we read uh, Gilgamesh, we read the story of Gilgamesh, and I was talking to them about comparing it to the Iliad, and how the, the different attitudes, it's just like comparing the Greek attitudes in Herodotus to the Persian attitudes, and how, for example, in the Iliad, the, the Agamemnon feels the need to persuade the other people to come go along and do what he wants. He's not just the tyrant telling them, you know, the, the overall emperor telling him, you do this, and they're just a bunch of peons. I mean, there's a lot of interesting cultural differences that you can see in the two stories, and it's, it's worthwhile to, and, and that these cultural differences have made a difference in our society all down the centuries. So it's interesting to to uh, make these kind of comparisons in that respect, if you're if you want to do that, you know. Yeah, uh, good thing Xerxes lost, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah, right. Holy smoke! Uh, yeah. So this this Western canon, you know, I think it matters. Um, not everything that you would think is a great book belongs in there either. I think you know, I often get asked, "Why don't you read Beowulf?" Mm. Well, you know, Beowulf was lost for almost a thousand years. I don't think I don't think that that thing was rediscovered until the early 1800s. Ah. And, and so it's old. Maybe it's important. Maybe it's wonderful. But because it was lost for all those years, you know, Shakespeare doesn't reference it. He didn't even know what the heck it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> later on, maybe we'll end up putting it in there. You know, maybe we'll say that Tolkien's work is important and should make the canon. Maybe. And if that's the case, then maybe Beowulf should go in there because it informed it. You know, it might make it. But today, no, it doesn't because it doesn't 
you can't draw that thread of rationality and aesthetic mm. um, all the way to the future uh, mm. through through uh, through Beowulf. So you know we don't read everything. So I get some criticism for well, why don't you read my favorite book? Well, mm. well we can't read them all, yeah. um, and uh, and they're not all as important as you think they are. It's mm. really hard to make the varsity team, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. th it's Aristotle and Plato. Uh, and then another thing, uh, reading these books for an honest person and not everybody is, uh, is so, mm, it, it, it points out how there is nothing new. Uh, and you, you, you probably disagree with me on this, Marsha. I just don't think that mankind has, a, uh, has advanced a great deal. Uh, there aren't political problems described that today that Aristotle didn't anticipate and describe and characterize fully. Like there is, like Shakespeare says, there is nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are still faced with all the same darn problems. And, you know, reading accounts of the smartest people that ever lived wrestling with them, with these problems, and um, knowing that we still have to deal with them uh, will disabuse one of utopianism. Mm. You know? And I sure think that's good. I mean, the whole progressive project, project is a, a utopian fever dream. You know? uh, if we can just do enough of X, you know, we're going to get there. Well, what's there? How will we know? You know what, what are we progressing towards? They really can't say that. Uh, but, but knowing that somebody like that, giants like Aristotle and Plato had wrestled these things in a very thoughtful way 2000 years ago and that we're still dealing with it. I, to me, that's comforting. On one hand, it's sort of disheartening, but on the other hand, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's comforting. Well, I, you know, I agree and I disagree with you. I agree for the most part. What I disagree about is that we have had a lot of material progress, which is great. If, if our standard is thriving human life, we've had a lot of material progress, which has really helped and then we also had the genius uh, creation of the United States. It's got tremendous flaws. It's, we've had a lot of errors. But if you look at what they did with the Constitution, it was a, an entirely new idea about how to uh, organize society. And yet, super informed from the great books, super informed from the classics. And they were, they were very practical men. They knew the flaws of human nature and tried to deal with it in the way that they were setting up this representative government. So those okay. things I think are advances, but let's not get off that. <laughs> let's well, not get know, off into that. Well, well, let's talk about the material comfort. Yeah. You know, I don't know that that's true. You know, we've got antibiotics and that's good. You know, I had an appendectomy when I was 16 that, you know, a hundred years prior to that, I, I wouldn't have made it. Uh, but, you know, I, re I read these old books and these people had rich, wonderful lives. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, and that helps put the technology in perspective. You know, mm -hmm. is it better? It, it, are things better? You know, I, I, uh, I think it's the assembly women, Aristophanes assembly women, I think. The guy gets up in the morning. It's right in the first four or five pages. Uh, uh, guy, a guy gets up in the morning and he swings his legs out of bed and he expects his house shoes to be there. And they're not. And he says, oh, I bet my wife slipped my house shoes on to take out the trash and didn't put them back. Mm -hmm. Like, what? It, we're still, we're st <laughs> I mean, still doing that. <laughs> it's, the same, it's, it's the same old stuff with iPhones, man. You know, it, 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 that pleases me. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I look at it this way. Most of us would have been slaves before technology. Yeah, most of us still are. And we have the opportunity now to spend a lot more time uh, understanding and enjoying our cerebral interests if we want to, and all kinds of functions that we couldn't have previous, that we would have been busy, you know, cleaning somebody's shoes. So. Well, see, we're back to book one, chapter one of Aristotle's yeah. Politics, where he talks about the natural slave, you know, right. uh, like at what? So it, I'm going to mess this up. It's been a while since I've read it. Aristotle says, there are some people that are really good at making decisions. Mm -hmm. And they are really good. In, 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 for him, most things relate to agriculture. Because by golly, that's what it would have been. And yeah. frankly, it still is whether you want to believe it or not. 
so there are some people that are really well suited to making decisions and really well suited for management of resources and husbandry. Mm -hmm. And those people, they're talented and they have this gift. And as such, they should be in charge of making lots of decisions and managing resources. There is another group of people that ain't like that. They're not good at making decisions. Uh, they're, they're weak of mind or weak of body. Uh, they vacillate. Uh, maybe they don't even like the pressure, right? Maybe they have the intellect, but they, they don't want the responsibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, here I'll be sneaky, yada, 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 natural slaves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like if there's an extremely talented managerial class, nobody wants to talk about this stuff anymore. Uh, then maybe there's a group of people that just doesn't, isn't well suited for being in charge of anything. And mm -hmm. maybe they need to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about that, but by golly, there's a whole lot of people that just aren't going to take the, the bull by the horns and, or grasp the nettle or move the ball down the field. And uh, they well, can he, work at the Amazon warehouse, right? He's not, he's not talking about any particular group. It's uh, in, a, in any particular racial group, ethnic group, or anything oh. like that. He's just saying that, that there are different dispositions and different approaches that people take to life. And some of them are more suited to be told what to do and to just follow along and others to be the ones in charge. That, yep. to me, that's his basic argument. I, I think that's right. And, yeah. then, and then because economic productivity, this is, this is me opining now. I think I made his case as honestly as I could just before. And this is my opinion now. Because the economic conditions were so unproductive there, pre-steam, mm -hmm. pre-iron, pre et cetera, et cetera, uh, a minimum wage might in fact be here's your gruel in a place to sleep mm -hmm. you know a dollar 75 an hour minimum wage was beyond the pale in those sorts of economic mm -hmm. conditions at that time mm -hmm. so you end up with people who work menial tasks for mere subsistence mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. so slavery think that's his basic his basic argument yeah. Well, I don't think that I don't think that's an argument that he makes. But uh, we're to, today we can say we're all high and mighty, and that we don't believe in that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. We're going to pay them fifteen dollars an hour, but they're not slaves. You see, mm -hmm. well, wait a minute, who's getting ahead on fifteen dollars an hour? Who who's self actualized on fifteen bucks an hour? You know, who can pursue the kind of life they want to pursue? No one. You can't. And, and, and you know me, I'm not advocating for a universal basic income or anything, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying that the economic productivity of an individual person has advanced to the point that we can look at ourselves and say, oh, you know, we're not like that at all. We don't keep slaves, you see. We're mm -hmm. much different because we give them a W-2 at the end of the year. All um, right. Well, I, I, I would somewhat disagree with you, but I'd like to get back to our topic <laughs> of how, no! how your, your, your company, the online great books, why great books are... so. Why do you think everyone should be educated in the great books? Do you think, or most people, or, or how would you put it? If, if, somebody, if somebody's interested, but by golly, they need to do it. Okay. You know, there are people that don't care and, you know, what? don't do it, you know? What will it do for their life if they want to do it? Uh, it'll ruin your life. Uh, <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll ruin your life. It, it, you know, listen. What is it? Is it book five of Plato's Republic? You know, we get the story of the cave. Is it five? Is it six? You get six, the story of the cave. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you guys have probably heard the story of the cave. It's the Matrix. Yeah. The first Matrix movie is Plato's cave, yeah. right? He gets to see outside of the cave and he gets to see what's really happening and he's changed forever. So the, the, the life he had previous to that is lost to him. Mm hmm but now he gets to eat real food and see, see real things and have real battles and experience real peril. And all of that is good. And I'll, and I'll tell you, the books will let you out of the cave. Plato tells us in the Republic what it is, what it looks like. He tells you once you come out and you come back to the cave that your friends aren't going to like you anymore. The people outside the cave aren't going to like you. The ones inside the cave that you'll be, you'll be, well, so you'll, be a it, you'll be a lover. What is it of about your, how you're living better? afterwards it's more challenging you're using your capacities more how reality, would you characterize it reality on reality's terms is always better you know to 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 shake off these sort of mental scripts that we have been given and to see things as they are 
to to see the genealogy behind these the, these ideas to see uh you know to see this postmodern movement this social justice movement and to see uh, a the Puritans again, <laughs> you know, let's us see it for what it is. And, uh, and, and I, I think it's just a richer, more colorful, better life. So that uh, allows you to, to flourish more because I, you're, you, you have such, so much bigger and more challenging, richer, more interesting life. And the, these are the criteria that you're using for why it's better. Yeah. I, yes. Yes. You know, reading these books gives us a fund of knowledge that other people don't have. Anybody can go get it if they want to. Uh, but when, once you have that fund of knowledge, you, you have so many more, I'm going to call them, I don't know, mental templates. I don't know. You have, you have so much, a, so much larger framework to, to cognate from, to think from and to apply to problems that you see and to social issues that you see. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it gives you so much more perspective too. Like, you know, uh, on one hand, I, I always tell people when they, uh, at the orientation online grade books and they sign up that they're better than everyone else. <laughs> and I, I, I 100% believe that. Now, all you have to do is do the same thing and you're better than everyone else too. It's like, we're all better than everyone else, but it's not an exclusive club. You can get better too. Yeah. Uh, and, I, I, and it's not really, it's a certain way. It's not a competition. It has to do no. with how well you want to live your life. And I, do you think that knowing these ideas also helps you if you, if you want in work and if you want to create a business or anything like that or in whatever kind of profession you're in? I, I, I would think so. Uh, reading, well, now we have to talk about reading. I went to Catoosa Public Schools from 1979 to 1992 and they taught me to read and do a certain thing there. You know, whatever, you know, everybody knows what that thing is. They taught me to do that thing. You know, mm -hmm. I would have uh, quizzes on Friday and a midterm and a final. And then uh, we would take achievement tests in the spring and whatever the heck that was, you know, and, and that leads to a certain kind of reading and a certain kind of study mm -hmm. because it is a certain kind of a game. Mm -hmm. So they actually taught us to skim and scan. We went to this thing they called reading lab and we, they taught us to skin, skim and scan. I think that I was probably the, some of the last part of some of the last groups taught hardcore phonics. We actually had Dick and Jane readers mm. in uh, kindergarten and first grade. Mm. Uh, and then, with, then they, so I think we were taught to read actually very well in the same vein that kids in the fifties were probably in thirties and before, but they started to teach us to skim and scan. And you find that you start reading for the quiz. You're reading for the test. You're reading for the teacher, which is its own thing. Then you go to then you go into the world of work and you read to get what you need. You know, mm -hmm. I want to flip through this. I want to find out how to rebuild this carburetor. I'm going to look at that diagram on page 12. I'm going to do it and I'm going to close the book and I'm going to move on with my life. All of that's fine, but it's not what we do at online great books. You know, we we do close reading of difficult difficult material. We read some of this stuff that's three pages an hour, guys. I don't care how smart you are. If you're honest and you're reading Aristotle's metaphysics, it's three or four pages an hour. And if you're going faster than that, you're just bullshitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it, it's so darn hard, some of it. And it's so darn slow that it becomes a mindfulness meditation. You're constantly having to drag your brain back to the page. You know, so it's, it's training us for a difficult task in a way that nothing else can. Mm -hmm. uh, it exposes us to excellence you know, the, the beautiful stuff, you know, the Odyssey, I can read that much more quickly than three or four pages an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, even with the close reading, I can go 20, 30, 40 pages an hour, maybe with something like the Odyssey. But I get to see what excellence is, you know. Uh, and then, and then when you read well, and you read closely, and you read excellent stuff, you get to witness how someone else's, an excellent mind works. Mm -hmm. You know, to see how Aristotle, whether, you know, there's some people reading Aristotle's politics right now, or ethics right now. Um, and I was watching them, I was watching them talk about it in Slack. Uh, a couple of them don't buy his arguments about what the good life is and, uh, you know, his arguments in the Nick and McKeon ethics. Doesn't matter. They're getting to read along and follow the machinations of an excellent mind, mm -hmm. you know, and how can you do that? How can you apprentice to somebody like that? This is the only way you can do it. I'm, 
you know, unless you're Aristotle and can sit at Plato's knee, you know, you, you, you don't get these opportunities except for in these books. And if somebody teaches you the book, you don't get that part, right? Like if I go to the great courses, my nemesis, and buy the six hour Nick and McKeon ethics talk or 12 hour or whatever, that guy's going to teach me about it. I don't actually get to witness how Aristotle's thoughts unfold mm -hmm. and how he chose to communicate the contents of his mind to somebody else's. That's super important. You know, we've got a group, a group, we almost always continually have a group of people working through Euclid's Elements Book One. Mm -hmm. And he starts with the definition of a point and he goes all the way through. I think it's uh, Proposition 48, I think. It's the Pythagorean Theorem. Well, it's one of the best works to learn logic from. It, it's, you, you learn logic, mm -hmm. but you, for sure. And that's amazing. <laughs> You learn geometry without uses of notation. Mm -hmm. You know, the A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's not in there. That's algebra. That's later. It's not in there. But what you get to see is the excellence of Euclid's mind too. You're like, holy, cr the way he tackles the problems mm -hmm. is astounding. Well, and what, I, what I've noticed in, in learning that kind of thing and also in the discussion of it is that you get to see all the different ways that people approach the same ideas yeah. and how the excellent mind solves that problem. And then that becomes a template. You were talking about mental templates. That becomes a template for you to take away if, and for whatever you're doing. If you want to start a business, you have a wide range of ways to approach problems now. If you, if you, can, if you have the ability to transfer that over to the business problems, it just... It's, it's just fabulous in that respect. I remember um, Stuart Butterfield, who started Slack, the online uh, workspace that I know you use all the time. He said that he looks for people who have, uh, to hire people who have studied liberal arts. He went to, uh, he went to Oxford and studied um, philosophy and the history of science. And he said the history of science taught him how people could fail, the different ways that people failed. And that was very important in business. And then in, in studying philosophy, he learned all about how to think well. So I, that's basically what's happening when you're studying great books. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting history of science. I, I, I um, University of Oklahoma has a pretty decent history of science department, mm -hmm. School, and they've got a, a they've got an amazing collection of Galileo's notebooks and wow. stuff in its own hand. It's yeah. it's amazing, and I took some courses in that college i don't know what the hell they call it i don't know if it's a college i don't know if it's a school department i don't know what it is uh, and i'll tell you what though they were all it was all sneering it was all sneering oh isn't this quaint you know that's like, because of when you took it right because you were it was probably, like 1980 early, early 90s how yeah. dare you yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah it was all sneering like uh and they're wrong, but and, he's, and they're wrong, by the way. You know, you read Aristotle's physics, and he says, um, look, you know, heavy stuff wants to be as low as it can be. Mm -hmm. And they were like, <laughs> look at that, and it's so stupid. Mm -hmm. That has just as much explanatory power as our understanding of gravity. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 we, and we don't know anything more about gravity than the fact that weighty things want to be as low as they can be. Exactly. Like, oh, oh, okay. Tell me about how they want to be closest to the center of gravity of the, yeah. of a larger mass. Okay. I understand guys. I understand. But you under, but you have to understand, we don't know what gravity is. We don't know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. We haven't found any, like we don't know anything about it. Right. Yeah. So we don't know how the force works. We don't know no. anything about what makes it happen. Yeah. Newton gave us some heuristics that let us put a cannonball in a bucket over the horizon. Mm -hmm. We don't know how any of it works, guys. Mm -hmm. And but so that history of science department was really just it was it really had like it's kind of a shit eating grin on its face the whole time I was there, and it really mm -hmm. bothered me. Mm -hmm. Later on, I went and read. Um, so I read prior analytics, you know, Aristotle, I'm sorry, posterior analytics, read them both. Posterior like analytics. What's, tell, for the audience, tell them what's in posterior analytics. Posterior analytics is Aristotle trying to get his head around induction. Mm. Right. So we've got deduction. We all know that one. The famous one is all men, it's the syllogism, all men are mortals. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is immortal. 
We call that Barbara. It's a deadlock. If everything fits together and everything, if the first two premises are true, the last one has to be true. It's a dead lock. It's beautiful. Induction doesn't have any such thing as a deadlock. What's induction? Well, induction is where we, the scientific method is an inductive process where we try to take uh, observations of specifics and apply them to generals. So I would say, man, look, Mar I watched Marsha drop a ball 10,000 times. The next time she drops the ball, it's going to fall. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. I can't prove it, guys. I can't prove it. You know, science can't prove anything with induction. <clears throat> we can't do it yet. And we may never be able to. Somebody, you know, Karl Popper came up with the falsifiability test. And we, you know, we keep getting a little bit better and a little bit better, but we don't have a deadlock on inductive problems. And, and I think that's important to know that. It's really important to know that. Mm -hmm. You know, almost everything that quote unquote science has told us has been later completely been discarded and discredited. Mm -hmm. Ptolemy said that the planets move like this. Galileo said, no, 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 they move like that. And then Newton said, no, 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 they move this other way. And then Einstein said, oh, no, 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 it doesn't, it's nothing. Like everything that we ever thought, we found out almost everything that we've ever thought we found out wasn't accurate. It was a useful heuristic for the time and we end up discarding it. And it's really important, I think, for us to know that. And if you read 3,000 years worth of books, you'll see the smartest guy on the globe for two or 300 years, put forth the best idea possible and then only to have it shot down 300 years later. And, and you were saying when you went to read the posterior analytics, what happened? Well, I, I just realized that this whole induction thing ah. is so damn shaky. Mm -hmm. And I had, I, you know, and yet somehow we microbiology uh, and chemistry background. And that's all we do is induce, right? We, yeah form a hypothesis and we do our testing and blah, 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 blah. Uh, and everybody acts like we know stuff. Well, and yet we seem to. We, we so seem to. How, how that happened. Because, and one of the proofs is that we're able to predict things, we're able to know how to do things, and we're able to get things that we need. So right. that, that's, and it's, so it's a mystery. It's still kind of a mystery about how it happens. Heuristic, these are back to this mental template yeah. idea. These heuristics, um, these ways of thinking are very useful and they do give us this predictive power. They let mm -hmm. us put the can of ball in the bucket over the horizon. Mm -hmm. But heuristic and technology, a technological solution and you know, heuristic does not arise to the same level of a, of a test of truth claims as deduction does. Mm -hmm. So... However, deduction is based on induction. Well, we're, we're still making observations of the specific. Right. And then we, come but we take the, a come up with the concepts. You had to do yeah. induction. So, uh, so that, that's, you know, that's the, the, that's one the of problem. The problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, understanding that there are problems of induction, let's just take it all with a grain of salt, see it for what it is, Maybe go ahead and build a bridge and trust that we can drive over it with a heavy truck, mm -hmm. but maybe understand that we don't fully and completely understand why it all works. And that that's important to get rid of the hubris. You know, and it's important to, to have accuracy about what you know and what you don't know. It may, make you a lot more cautious. Yeah. It may, you know, ha having a liberal arts education and reading all the people of all the best people of the last 3000 years fail mm -hmm. <laughs> over and over and over again is good insurance against hubris that might lead you to be a social scientist that assert all kinds of things as fact that you mm -hmm. have no possible way of proving. Yeah, exactly. Social science. What? Hey, uh, I just want to, I don't want to keep you on too long. So I just want to get back to um, telling us a little bit more about your program of online grade books. So people sign up. They are supposed to do the reading half, a, half an hour a day for six days. You send them the books. You start with the Iliad? We don't. You don't? You start we don't. with? We start with Mortimer Adler's book, How to Read a Book. Ah, okay. uh, I have a home group that reads these books, and we've been meeting now for five or six years. And it's well, mostly, I think we're pretty smart. You know, a bunch of people with uh, a bunch of uh, engineers and um, folks with 
there's an attorney in there, you know, we've all went to school, know something at least. And we jumped right into Plato and we found out we were not equal to it. Mm -hmm. That we found that we were, we didn't know how to read that way. We skimmed and we scanned and, you know, we mm -hmm. just didn't have those skills and we backed up and we read Mortimer Adler's book, how to read a book. Mm -hmm. And Adler, Adler, Adler gives you a whole bunch of tips and tricks for close reading of difficult material. He gives you permission to go slow. He gives you permission to reread. Uh, one of the most important things in that book, I think, is his line uh, about the purposes of reading. He says the purpose of reading is to go to a state of less understanding to one of more understanding. These books, you cannot completely understand Aristotle's metaphysics. You can't do it. Mm -hmm. Avero was supposedly read it like 52 times before he started to understand, he said. That's why it's called him the teacher. Um, you can't. You can't get it all. And I find that people, particularly if they've been successful academically, mm -hmm. all academically now, they have a perfectionism about them that really makes it hard for them to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but Adler tells us, it's okay, man. It's okay. Just get an extra percentage point of it every time. You know, go from a state of less understanding to one of more understanding. Mm -hmm. we're, we're educate, we're, we are learning for its own sake. We are learning for our own purposes. We're not, there's no, it's the university. There's no grades, mm -hmm. there's no homework. Uh, so that's where we start. We now start our program with Mortimer Adler's book, How to mm -hmm. Read a Book. And um, um, people, go get it yourself. Don't jo join us. Don't join us. Whatever. Go get the book and read it. Um, it will be enormously helpful to you. Uh, and then that's month one. Month two is the Iliad. And then we read the Odyssey. And uh, we read them all in chronological order, which is a slow way to do it. And people have their criticisms of that. But I'm right and they're wrong. And that's mm -hmm. how we do it. So how many books do you all read together in total? Uh, well, we don't even know yet. Um, we have a little handbook that we send out, the Online Great Books handbook that we send to all of our members when they join. Uh, and it has what we think will be our list in there. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have to make terrible compromises, you know, because we just, we're not going to live long enough. None of us will to read all the things <laughs> we should. Right. Um, uh, but right now, so what, what ends up happening is uh, me and Josh Warsham, we read ahead of group one, a couple mm -hmm. of months ahead of them mm -hmm. and write up all the reading goals and all of the, the email communications and stuff over each of those texts about a month or two months ahead of group one mm -hmm. uh, and build the program one month at a time. You know, when I opened the business, we didn't have a, we had two months worth of program written. That's it. We mm -hmm. didn't know if it was going to work. Mm -hmm. So right now we have about 40 months of the program written and uh, that 40 months, that it takes about 40 months for us to really get a, a good scald on the classical period. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they pretty much dealt with, they've dealt with the, the Greeks in a quite an in-depth way and the Romans a little less in depth and are starting to move into the, uh, uh, the post-classical mm -hmm. period, which I do not call the dark ages, but uh, mm -hmm. start to move out of that. So one last question. So, uh, Owen, how much does this cost people if they want to sign up? Seven, nine, seventy nine dollars a month. And uh, I'll tell you, if you don't do the program, you know, if you don't use the reading goals, if you don't read, if you don't read and you don't go to seminar, it's way too expensive. <laughs> but if you do the thing, it's the cheapest, it's the cheapest money you'll spend. I'm, I'm t the, the, the seminars are fantastic. The Slack channel, the Slack community is fantastic. The accountability is fantastic. Everybody that actually does the program mm -hmm. stays. The people who don't stay are the ones who, who don't do it. Yeah. You know, no, I, I agree with you. That's the discussion on the Slack channel and in the seminars is just wonderful, enriching, uh, expanding, mind expanding. <clears throat> Couldn't agree with you more. But start a group at home. You know, you don't have to do it with us. I just want people to do this stuff. Uh, we have a very high success rate. You know, when people join us, if they make it through it with us for 90 days, um, they're transformed. Their mm -hmm. brains start to work differently. They, this has become a habit in their lives and they stay with us for years. Uh, but um, go get the Adler book. He's got his reading list in the back of it. Our reading list and Adler's reading list, the Venn diagram, <laughs> overlap mostly um, and go invite three or four or five friends to read that book with you and then start with the Iliad after you finish that one and do it much better than what you usually read in book club. Oh 
Yeah, no, no, no. We, it's yeah. not a book club. It's not, you don't tell it two thumbs up. It's got a good beat. It's easy to dance to. No. It's, you know, what was this book about? What are the author's arguments for, for his, the, his or her thesis? Mm -hmm. you know, do, we, do we agree or not? Why do we agree or not agree? What are the consequences of this? You know, it, it's, um, you know, St. John's College says that we steal so much of what we do from their methodologies and the work they've done. Uh, uh, we've got some Johnnies that work with us here too. Uh, I have heard that St. John says that the close reading of the difficult text is actually done in seminar. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I think that's true. You know, you, you're going to read when, but when you're alone, you're going to get what you can get, right? You bring your consciousness to bear on Aristotle or whatever, and you're going to get what you can get. And you're going to make notes and underline and write questions about the things you don't get. Don't make notes about the stuff you agree with or understand everybody. That's a waste of time. It's you're patting yourself on the back. Don't do that. You make notes about the things you don't understand. You underline the things you don't understand. You make write questions, specific questions about the text. You write those down probably in the book. And then when you come to seminar, those are the things you tackle. Mm -hmm. and you and your cronies, five, six, eight, ten 10 of you all come to bear on those problems. And, and a, a lot of stuff happens. You got more mental horsepower coming to that problem and some clarity emerges. Mm -hmm. I just said some, not entirely, right? Some of it's hard guys, yeah. but you also actually will start to act on the book. Mm -hmm. You actually do something, you know, reading can be very passive. Um, and we, we want to do active reading you know, where we engage with the text as we read it. We don't just have our eyes pass over and just take it in. We actually engage with it. But when you, when you take a time away from the book, carry the book to the seminar, re-engage with the book, and then introduce these problems that you had with the book in the seminar. Uh, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a phase state change or something. Mm -hmm. you, take, you take the problems in the book out of the realm of reading and into the realm of the personal and the interpersonal mm -hmm. and that the reading comprehension goes up enormously way up, way up. yeah well you, this you is, won't know exactly, anything about metaphysics <laughs> that's well, okay this, nobody this, does this is exactly what we do in the great connection seminars when i'm able to especially when i'm able to have them in person with the young people they uh, end up having a, a transformative experience and yeah. especially because they come away realizing that they can tackle anything. If they can understand this stuff, they can understand anything and they don't need to depend on an authority for it, yeah. which is fantastic, right? Because yeah. you, don't, you don't want that when you're, when you're adult. You want to be able to make your own judgments. Um, well, authorities are bad anyway. Like who, who, what, how, listen, how are you going to figure out who the authority is? Right, exactly. It's, it's authorities all the way down. And some exactly. you draw right. a line in the sand and yeah. you have to say, I'm sufficient. Aristotle's sufficient. He yeah. and I are getting ready to wrestle. Yeah, exactly. And, and you go do it. So you, you ask how I got into this. So I told some of it. One of the biggest events that brought me to this was I took my wife and children's to uh, Colonial Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, William and Mary College is up on, just down the end of the main drag there, Duke of uh, Gloucester Street. And Jefferson and so many of these giants went to school there. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't like you think of school, college now. They would have sauntered in there at about 15 years old, maybe 16 years old, mm -hmm. stayed for a time and then left. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably weren't given a sheepskin or any sort of diploma. And they, they spent some time, they got what they needed and they left. They went for their own purposes for a time when it suited them and then they left and you can go to george wyeth's house there he he taught law at uh william and mary college there and uh he has a lot he had a he had a little outbuilding there that's all made of stone mm -hmm. and it kind of looks like a smokehouse but that's the library he got all the books out of the house because fire was such a problem you know so he's got a little library outside and he, and he had a he had a study room um uh, and it really was a study because he didn't keep the books in the house, which I thought was cool. And there was a big round table there. 
And he would have these kids, these are like 15, 16, 17 year old kids come to that study and they would sit around that round table and they would argue about these damn books. Yes. That's what they did. Mm-hmm. The stuff that happened at the school, I realized was irrelevant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they learned some surveying and some geometry and a few things like that. The st- the, the, the stuff that got us the Virginia House of Burgesses, the stuff yeah. that got us the Constitution was done at that table at George Wyeth's house. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm 100% convinced of it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was like, oh, we've got to do this. It, and these are the books that he read. What else would he have read, guys? Scott Forsman didn't make textbooks. There was no Harcourt Brace Johanovich. There was no Macmillan mm-hmm. Company. Mm-hmm. There was no such thing as a textbook. You went to the guy who did the seminal work and you parsed it out. Yeah. And there were no experts. You're on an edge of a new continent. <laughs> there are no experts. It's you and this older guy that cares about you and your buddies. And that's in the book and that's it. And look at what we got. Yeah. Right. Yep. And the farther away from that we get, the crazier everything becomes. I'm convinced of it. Yeah. It's you, some mentor that cares about you in the book. That's it. Mm-hmm. Well, on that note, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. It was delightful as usual. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that we, you and I could go on for quite a long time. Uh, yeah. But I thought the audience might, <clears throat> might uh, think this was a good point to stop. And I, I wanted to let it, uh, thank you again. And I, I'll tell the audience that we're going to put all the information about how you can sign up for online grade books in our notes and other things that we've referenced in the interview. So yeah. any last thing you'd like to say, Scott? Oh, it's easy, easy. Go to onlinegreatbooks.com and you can join there. And you know, Marsha leads uh, some seminars and stuff there. She needs to do more, but she's always trying to do these other things. <laughs> it, re- it really cramps my style, all this other stuff. you. <laughs> Sorry. Do. Sorry. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, ma'am.